All right, so we're going to get started. Um, so welcome to today's online charter series webinar hosted by the Center for Constitutional Studies at the University of Alberta. Uh, we're pleased that you're joining us today. Uh, my name is Alina Reitzma. I'm the Center's Public Legal Education Coordinator and I'll be moderating this session. Um, as this is a webinar, uh, many of you may be watching from across Canada, some of you might even be elsewhere. Um, so I would encourage you uh, to reflect upon the land wherever you are, as I reflect on the land here. Uh, the Center for Constitutional Studies is located at the University of Alberta in Edmonton on Treaty 6 territory. And the center acknowledges and honors the ancestors, traditions, and the spirit the first true Indigenous peoples, the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Stoto, Inuit, and then settlers to this gathering place. We also recognize the ongoing acts of settlement and colonization that take place on this territory. The center um, enjoys the benefits of treaty and the center recognizes that land acknowledgement um, is only a very small step in recognizing and upholding Treaty 6. So before I introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Sarah Burningham, uh, I'm just gonna run through the format uh, for today's webinar. Uh, so you first you'll note the chat function is disabled, um, but you will be able to ask questions through the Q&A button that you should see on the bottom of your screen. You will be able to see one another's questions and you can upvote them. So you'll see a little kind of thumbs up by a question. If you like it, you can hit it and it'll bump it up the list for us towards the top. Um, if you want to ask a question anonymously, there's an option to do that as well. Uh, once I'm finished with this introduction, uh, Sarah is going to present and then we'll take questions uh, from the attendees. Um, also note that there will be a little pop-up at the end of the webinar with a uh, link to a feedback form and we would greatly appreciate uh, if you fill that out for us. Uh, lastly, please note the webinar is being recorded um, and it will be available on our YouTube channel and on our website um, in a couple days. So this webinar is part of our online charter series and the purpose um, of this um, is to explore various sections and aspects of the charter. And today we're gonna to learn about some of the options that are available uh, to remedy a breached charter right. Um, so with us today, of course, is Professor Burningham. Um, and I'll just give her a brief introduction. Uh, Sarah Burningham is an assistant professor at the University of Saskatchewan's College of Law. She studied law first at the University of Saskatchewan, receiving her LLB before studying at the University of Oxford for a Bachelor of Civil Law. And she clerked with the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal. She has taught constitutional law, criminal law, administrative law and evidence, and has received recognition uh, for her teaching excellence. Her research is primarily in constitutional law with interest in criminal law and evidence as well. And she has numerous publications. Um, a couple of her recent ones are The Relevance of Government Practice and Constitution Decision-Making, which was published last year in the Osgood Hall Law Journal, and an article, Provincial Jurisdiction Over Abortion, published in the Queen's Law Journal in 2019. Her writings have been cited in uh, judicial decisions and her op-eds have appeared in the National Post and the Regina Leader Post. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn things over to Sarah, the person that you want to hear from today. Uh, so Sarah, if you want, you can go ahead. All right, great. Thanks so much for that introduction. And thank you for inviting me to speak today. So today I'm going to be talking about what a court does if it's found that a law violates the charter. What remedy is a court likely to order? So I'm going to share a PowerPoint here. So if you'll bear with me for a moment while I get that set up. Okay, I think that should be working there. That looks perfect. So, great, thank you. This topic of charter remedies is really broad and it can be quite complex and we're only limited to a, a certain amount of time today. So I'm just going to give you a small slice of the topic. I'm not gonna talk about the complicated issue of jurisdiction to order remedies, which courts and which administrative tribunals have jurisdiction to order which remedies. And I'm not gonna talk at length about individualized remedies. So these would be remedies for wrongful state action, like a wrongful police detention. Rather, I'm going to focus on discussing general principles around remedies and talk about the, the common scenario, what a judge does when they find that a law is unconstitutional. What remedy do they order, order as a result of that? 
So my comments today are mostly about legislation, about statutes. I'm really excited to talk about this topic We've just had some important Supreme Court cases come down in the last few years, and they've sort of done a lot of work in setting the stage um, and reiterating some fundamental principles, but sort of changing the direction uh, on a few points. And so I think it's a, a chance for us to think about remedies in light of these new cases, and that's a really neat opportunity. So these are the sort of underlying questions we're going to have for today's lecture. What remedies are available? Uh, what principles guide judges in determining which remedy to order? And throughout this, we're going to be talking about the proper institutional role of the court, right? In our system of governance, we've divided power between the court and the legislative and executive branches. We think that the court's job is to interpret laws, to protect the constitution. The court's job is not to make new policies, to make new legislative regimes. And so as the court is thinking about which remedies to order, it's going to be very aware of its institutional role, that it's not a policy maker. That's the job properly for our legislative bodies. So there are three different sections in our Constitution Act 1982 that empower courts to grant remedies. Section 24, there's two subsections to it that we're gonna talk about. Section 24 is about individualized remedies, remedies for wrongful, um, unconstitutional action by state actors. So like a wrongful and unconstitutional uh, police detention or an arbitrary search. Uh, section 52, the other section we're gonna spend quite a bit of time discussing is about remedies for unconstitutional laws. So I have up on the screen there, section 24.2. Section 24.2 allows for the possibility that evidence that's found, um, that's found as a result of an unlawful uh, uh, state action, an unconstitutional state action can be excluded at trial. So I'm wrongfully searched. Um, I'm searched in an arbitrary manner in a manner that violates my constitutional rights. And the search turns up drugs. On When I face my, my drug trial, I can seek to have those drugs excluded as a remedy to the charter breach that happened during the search. It's not automatic. That, that evidence will be excluded. And you can see that that's going to be devastating to the Crown's case, right? The lack of evidence will, will uh, make it unlikely that the Crown will be successful in its case. Uh, but it's a pretty profound remedy there that um, as a, um, a solution or a, a potential um, result, uh, if the police violate charter rights in the course of um, investigation, that evidence can, um, might not go in front of the judge, right? It might be excluded as a result of that charter breach. So that's one uh, put potential rent, uh, remedy. That's one uh, uh, step, uh, route to a remedy under the charter. Uh, the next one I wanna talk about uh, relatively briefly, I'm gonna talk about section 24 relatively briefly because section 52 uh, is more common, that's what I wanna focus on. But I do want to, to mention section 24 sub one. Again, this is for individualized remedies for unconstitutional acts of state actors. So you can see when you look at the text of that provision, it provides judges with a lot of discretion about how to write charter violations. Right, you see the terminology used there is appropriate and just. Okay, so judges do have a lot of room under this provision to develop tailored and somewhat creative remedies to solve uh, and to rectify charter breaches. But again, judges are going to be constrained by their institutional role, recognizing that their job is to safeguard rights and not to create. Uh, new legislative or policy uh, regimes. So some of the examples we've seen under 24.1 of individualized remedies 
we've seen monetary damages in the case of um, an illegal strip search by police. Um, the, the claimant was awarded $5,000 in charter damages. Uh, we've seen injunctions. So injunctions are orders that restrain the state from doing something. We've also seen mandatory orders, orders that the state must do something to rectify the charter breach. These are pretty rare, um, and there are certain considerations in the case law about when these are appropriate. Um, the more common remedy, as I've already said, is, uh, we see under 52, which is related to, um, to uh, legislation that violates the charter. Uh, one remedy that is of particular interest under 24.1 for us, though, are these exemptions. Um, the exemption is this idea that the law is pretty good, it's mostly constitutional, but in the odd case, it violates charter rights, right? In some of the law's rare applications, um, it, it impacts individuals in a manner that violates their charter rights. But instead of striking down the whole law, which is pretty good overall, the solution, the idea behind the exemption is the solution would be just exempt the person whose rights are being violated, right? They're exempted from the law. The law is upheld, but that person's given, um, given um, an exemption from the application of the law to solve the constitutional problem. So at one point in a 2008 case called Ferguson, the Supreme Court had really cast doubt on the idea that exemptions had much role to play in our constitutional structure. Um, and so we sort of thought, well, exemptions won't be that common. The Supreme Court was concerned that, that exemptions created uncertainty, that they resulted in inconsistent application of the law. And it felt that it was a better approach to just strike down a law uh, rather than exempt people from it. But in the last few years, in some of these recent cases that I mentioned in the introdu introduction, the Supreme Court has again opened the door to exemptions, which is pretty interesting to see what will happen uh, with that. Um, so I'm gonna talk about that at the end of the lecture if there's time. Okay, so I really wanna focus on section 52 sub one. So there's the language of section 52 sub one. Uh, you'll notice that it affirms for us the constitution as the supreme law of Canada and states that any law that's inconsistent with the constitution is of no force and effect. So this is also called the supremacy clause. It's important to understand in our system that we have this hierarchy of laws, right? The constitution is at the top and all other ordinary laws have to comply with the constitution. They have to be consistent with it. If they don't comply, they're, they're not good laws. They're null and void. They're of no force and effect. So judges under 52, are empowered to investigate whether laws comply with the constitution. And if they don't, they have the, the power and in fact, the obligation to strike those laws down, right? It can present some tensions for us, this power of judges to strike down laws, laws that are passed by our elected representatives. And we're having unelected judges uh, tell us those laws are no good. But that's the power judges have as the guardians of the Constitution. That's the power that the founders of the Constitution uh, gave to judges. It's not obvious when you read Section 52, but judges actually have a choice about what to do with an unconstitutional law or provision, a section within a law. So I've put on the screen there some examples of under 52, um, the, the different options uh, judges have under section 52. And I'm gonna talk about these in turn. Um, so this first one, this declaration of invalidity, this is the most common. Most often judges that find a provision is unconstitutional are going to hold that it's inconsistent and what we call strike it down. Um, 
so this is a, a declaration of invalidity. The law is invalid. And usually they'll do this with the challenge provision or in some rare cases, the entire statute. Um, so the, the provision is not consistent with the charter. It's null, it's void, it's not good law. So an example where we see this is the case of Morgenthal. So I just wanted to give you some examples to illustrate what this looks like. Morgan Toller, you might recall, uh, is, uh, came about in the, the mid and late 80s. Morgan Toller was a challenge to the regime around abortion. So at the time, abortion was generally prohibited under the criminal code, but there was an exception to that prohibition. If um, an individual obtained perm permission from one of these therapeutic abortion committees, then she could receive an abortion and that wouldn't be an offense uh, to, for her to receive one and for her to be provided uh, with one. So the criminal code set up this process, this, uh, this prohibition against abortion and then this exception. And then it was quite an, uh, um, an onerous process to go to get permission from a committee. There wasn't a lot of guidance in the statute so decision-making by committees was pretty inconsistent across the country. It was pretty arbitrary. You, know, you couldn't predict in advance whether the committee was gonna say yes or no. And there was quite a lengthy delay in many cases. Um, and so it could take weeks to get a result. Um, and the longer uh, a woman delays getting an abortion, the riskier that process becomes to her despite abortion being generally a very safe um, procedure. Um, so the majority of the Supreme Court found that this process, which was so arbitrary and stressful and imposed um, uh, this delay on the woman, um, increasing risks to her physical health, they found that this violated Section 7. Section 7 protects our rights to life, liberty, and security of the person. Uh, and they found that it couldn't be saved under Section 1. If you're familiar with the structure of our charter, you'll recall that section one um, lets the government save um, infringements of rights if they're you know, sort of reasonable, uh, demonstrably justified infringements. So the courts confronted with the question of remedy. Uh, what should they do here? Should they strike down just the committee process, leaving just the prohibition in place? So a prohibition against abortion with no uh, route for an exemption? Or should they sh strike down both the committee process and the prohibition? And ultimately they decide to strike down both the prohibition and the, the process. They don't try, try to tinker with the process to make it a better process, a more efficient process. Um, they strike it down, it's declared invalid. Um, and so that's what you'll often see judges do it's just the whole law, unconstitutional, strike it down rather than trying to fix it. Um, but sometimes they can fix it. it. The constitutional problem in a statute can be remedied by relatively small surgery on the provision without the need to strike the provision down. So we do have options for a judge that can fix the constitutional problem by doing something to the wording of the provision or to the scope of the, the, scope of the provision. And if, if that tinkering will bring it into compliance with the constitution, the judge might very well prefer that instead of striking down the entire provision. Okay, so Justice Karakat Sanis has called these tailored remedies. And you see three different options um, that a judge can, can choose in these circumstances that just involve this sort of surgical approach um, to fixing the constitutional problem. So we've, we've called them reading in, reading down, and severance. And I'm gonna talk about each of these in turn and give you some examples of how judges um, confronted with a constitutional problem might opt for one of these more narrow remedies to solve the constitutional issue. Okay, so sometimes judges can fix a constitutional problem 
by reading words into a statute that's otherwise under-inclusive. So an example comes out of Alberta, the case of Reed. In that case, Alberta's human rights code excluded sexual orientation from the scope of its protection. Okay, so under the legislation, a private business couldn't, could not discriminate against someone on the basis of race or religion, but it could discriminate against someone on the basis of sexual orientation. And the Supreme Court found that that violated Section 15 equality rights, setting up uh, human rights legislation in that way that excluded this vulnerable uh, group uh, was a Section 15 violation. And then it turns to what to do about that. So the, the statute's unconstitutional. It violates equality rights. Should we strike down the statute, which means nobody has any human rights protection? Obviously, that's a very distasteful result to the court. And ultimately, it decides that it can read in sexual orientation. So it adds sexual orientation to the list of protected grounds in the human rights code. It decides that that remedy is consistent with the legislative goal of having human rights protection. That's what the legislature wanted to do with the code. And so extending the, the protection of the code is consistent with what the legislature was trying to do with the code in the first place. Okay, so that's an example of reading in um, a very precise uh, language to fix the constitutional problem rather than strike down the whole statute. You can see that that's not gonna work every time. Sometimes you might have to read in too much, right? And it's not precise enough and it's just, it just uh, butchers the regime that parliament had set up and the judges are gonna be concerned, well, we're starting to become legislators if we start to tailor um, or tinker with the regime too much. You know, imagine Morgenthaler, uh, the government, uh, the, pardon me, imagine in Morgenthaler, the court, trying to create a whole new process for seeking exemptions. It just starts to look like policy making at that point. Okay, so it's appropriate here because it's precise, because it's consistent with what the legislature was trying to do by passing a human rights code, it was trying to protect rights. Um, sometimes judges can fix a constitutional problem by narrowing the scope of a provision. So Apollona, uh, sorry, pardon me, Apollo Napa is our example here. Um, in that case, the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act makes it an offense to help people enter Canada uh, without them first going through the process put in place under the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. Um, so to help people enter Canada who don't have uh, the proper um, authorization to do so. Uh, the purpose behind the legislation is to uh, uh, prevent and to punish uh, trafficking, human trafficking. But it's overbroad. It's catching people who are, for example, helping uh, vulnerable people flee uh, persecution in their home countries. Um, and so the court finds that this law is overbroad. It violates Section 7. Um, and it can't be saved as under section one. But again, instead of striking down the whole provision and losing that protection against um, human trafficking, right? That's what would happen if you strike down the whole provision. Now, um, human traffickers um, can have the go ahead, right? Um, that's not the concern here. The concern is people who are engaged in humanitarian um, uh, efforts. And so they, they read the, the provision down they narrow it, okay? The offense actually doesn't apply as broadly as it looks like it does on the text. It applies uh, more narrowly. And that's the solution. That's the remedy to the constitutional problem. Sometimes judges can fix a constitutional problem by editing or adjusting bits of the actual text of, this, of the section or the provision. And so for that, I have an example out of Saskatchewan, the Whatcott decision. So Whatcott involved a challenge to Saskatchewan's human rights code 
uh, the Human Rights Code prohibited the display of um, images that, um, that promoted hatred, but also images that ridiculed or belittled. Um, and so the challenge was brought that this was a violation of Section 2B, which protects expression rights, right? Free expression is protected by Section 2B of the Charter. So the court found that the provision was partially constitutional. It's constitutional in Canada to prohibit hate speech. Okay, that, that's, um, that's a justifiable limit on our right to free speech and free expression. But it's not constitutional to limit speech that merely ridicules or belittles. Yes, that speech is very distasteful, but in our society that values free speech, we have to tolerate distasteful speech. So the court looked at the provision and I have it on the screen there, you can see the provision. And so they deleted the little bit that was unconstitutional. And that brings it into alignment with the charter. Okay. So those are the different options that a judge has when looking at unconstitutional legislation. How does a judge know which one to choose? When should a judge strike down the whole regime? And when should a judge choose one of those more narrow or tailored remedies? So that's where this new Supreme Court decision comes in. I mentioned at the start of the lecture that this is a, an exciting decision because it's a revisitation of some of these principles around charter remedies. And so in the case of G, which is a 2020 Supreme Court decision, and you can always look up the Supreme Court's decisions on its website or um, on the free website Canly. Um, so in G, the court set out these different uh, remedial principles, it calls them, that should guide or structure decision-making. Judges have a lot of discretion about which remedy is appropriate, but it'll be, it'll be structured or guided by these four principles. So the principles uh, are very fundamental to some of our ideas around remedies, around the role of judging, judges in our, in our structure. So the idea that rights should be protected and that the public has an interest in uh, legislation complying with the charter. Right? The public is interested in charter compliant legislation. But at the same time, the public's also entitled to have legislation in place. So it's a preference for having legislation over having no legislation. And again, this recognition that the court has a different role than the government. It can't just remake things um, that it thinks the government did poorly and this would be a better policy or a better regime. It can't just redesign it, right? That's not the court's job. Um, so when choosing between those different Section 52 remedies I discussed, the judge is going to have to pay attention to um, how the provision violates the charter, what's the, what's the problem here, how does the provision fall short, especially when a judge wants to use tailored remedies, the judge will have to keep in mind, well, this is how exactly that section was inconsistent with the constitution, constitution, pardon me. Um, so after determining how the provision falls short, then a judge should consider which form of section 52 remedy is appropriate. So because the public is entitled to have legislation, we have a preference for legislation, we won't usually strike out a whole statute. We might strike out a whole section or two of that statute, but we won't usually strike out the whole statute. Um, so we'll look at these tailored remedies where we, they can solve the problem. One of the things that a court will keep in mind is what would the legislative body have done if they had known their statute was gonna be unconstitutional? Would they be okay with this more narrow tailored 
um, remedy that the court is thinking about? If yes, the judge is likely to adopt that remedy. But if it seems inconsistent with Parliament's um, goals through the legislation, the judge will just strike down the, the provision or the statute in its entirety. Um, and again, I, I can't uh, reemphasize enough about or emphasize enough about the importance of paying attention to institutional rules. Um, the judges uh, can't and don't and won't uh, create these new schemes to replace the ones they've found are unconstitutional. Uh, finally, I just wanted to mention a practical note here. I've been talking about Section 52 remedies, how the judge might, you know, sort of tinker with the with the wording of the text or might strike down the provision. Uh, but this doesn't actually um, appear on the face of the text of the statute. Okay, you can't read the statute or look at the statute and see that judicial change. That would require the legislature to repeal the statute or enact an amendment that changed the statute. So the legislature has control over their statute. They did, the legislature, the government decides what's in the statute. The court decides whether that's constitutional or not, right? So the court doesn't you know, physically go in with the Sharpie and delete, delete that part of the text from all the statute books. Um, it'll still be in the statute books, but it's just not constitutional, so it's no good, uh, even though it's physically present. So that's one of the reasons lawyers get specialized training, right? They get uh, training about what cases have said about the statutes. Just reading the statute, it wouldn't be enough to know whether the case law has found that provision constitutional or not. Um, it won't be obvious on the face of the statute whether something's been upheld or struck down. So it is, it is an access to justice problem, I think, that a lay person can't go read a statute and necessarily know whether it's good law or not. Um, that you would have to do more research and find how judges have interpreted or um, uh, decided on that provision. Finally, I wanna talk about one more uh, controversial topic and another one, another topic that's got some attention in these recent cases. So judges have this power to suspend their declarations of invalidity, okay? So this is the ability of judges to say, you know, I find this law is unconstitutional. It violates the charter, but my judgment is not gonna take effect yet. I'm gonna delay my judgment for a period of time. And there's no magic to the period of time. Uh, we've seen anywhere from four months to 12 months to 18 months. So this is a really weird power. It allows a law that we know is unconstitutional. We know this law violates rights. This power allows that law to continue to operate. It is valid for a period of time. It's a really weird power because it lets these violations of rights continue. And it's not obvious on the face of section 52 that judges even have the power to do this. Um, to, to let unconstitutional laws stay in place. Section 52, when you read it, it looks both mandatory and immediate, that there's no power to delay um, the, the declaration that the law is invalid. Okay, so this is the, the suspension power, the power to delay. Uh, this power, the judges recognize they had this power. It arose in a very uh, peculiar context. The originating case was Manitoba language rights, a case from uh, 85. So uh, that case involved a, a very unique circumstance. The constitution required that Manitoba's statutes, Manitoba's laws, its legislation be enacted in both English and French. Okay, that was a constitutional requirement that its statutes be bilingual, but Manitoba had passed pretty much all of its laws just in English. Okay, so that meant pretty much all of Manitoba's laws were unconstitutional, right? They violated the constitution. So they're 
not good. They're of no force and effect, they're invalid. So you could imagine the court being faced with this question. Do we strike down all of Manitoba's laws immediately? All of a sudden, there'll be no laws in Manitoba. I mean, there'd be federal laws, um, but you know, there's a huge swath of, of laws and people that rely on those laws and we have rights under those laws, provincial laws uh, that would be struck down, that they wouldn't be invalid. So should we do that immediately? Or should we give, give the government some time to reenact the laws in French? Once they reenact the laws in French, they'll be constitutionally compliant and they'll, they'll be valid. Um, and so you can imagine a huge legal vacuum or delay the decision by a few months. And so they ultimately decided to delay the, the, de the, the decision, the, the, the declaration that the laws were invalid by a few months. And they said, we have this constitutional principle called the rule of law. And the rule of law has a preference for having laws. And so this constitutional principle can be used to delay, uh, to delay the effect of our decision. Um, so we don't have this, this sort of anarchy um, if we strike down all these laws. Okay, so that's, that's a really extreme case. You can see why they wanted to, um, to keep the unconstitutional law laws in place for a while. Otherwise there was no law um, uh, whatsoever. But in the decades that followed, judges started suspending their decisions, uh, the, the effects of their decisions, the invalidity declaration. Uh, they started using the suspension very frequently. Um, and it was pretty unprincipled. We didn't get another case that was just like Manitoba language rights. It was often in cases um, that, you know, there weren't really high stakes involved like there was in that case. And judges sometimes gave reasons and sometimes they didn't give very good reasons and sometimes they didn't give any reasons at all. And so there started to be some academic criticism of this approach. Uh, courts are keeping unconstitutional laws in place for seemingly no good reason and without ex any explanation for why. Everyone can accept Manitoba language rights is a good reason to keep an unconstitutional law in place. But other cases, there doesn't seem to, there didn't seem to be that same um, that same uh, reason, that same um, uh, urgent need to keep an unconstitutional law in place. Um, so the Supreme Court in G is, is faced with the question of, well, what about these suspensions? When are they appropriate to keep these unconstitutional laws in place? And they, they have all this criticism in the background that's happening. And so in G, they wanna tell us uh, they want to tell us some rules, um, give us some confidence about the suspension. Um, so we have some firm guidance from this case of G um, telling us when suspensions are appropriate. And first they say, yes, there is a role for the suspension. That sometimes the court can keep unconstitutional laws in place. But it's going to be rare. Usually judges should strike down the law immediately. Okay, the law should fall immediately. But a suspension may be warranted when we do a balance of our remedial principles that I discussed earlier. And there might be a situation, you know, if there's a risk to the public, if the law falls immediately, well, if there's that risk to the public, we wanna give the par parliament or the legislature a chance to respond and to craft a new law to address that public safety risk. Right. Um, so we're not clear yet what's going to happen with G. Uh, G's just, you know, 18 months old. Um, so are judges going to roll back on their use of the suspension? Is it truly going to become rare? Uh, we'll have to see what happens, um, how that plays out in the next few years. Um, one of the interesting things that happened in G, and it relates to that 24-1 remedy of exemptions, uh, so in G, the court said, yes, we're going to allow suspensions. You know, the unconstitutional law will stay in place. But people whose rights are being violated, so the claimant, but also, you know, the person who brought the claim in the first place, but also other people whose rights are being violated, they can come to court during this time and they can get an exemption from the unconstitutional law. 
Okay, so that seems to be the solution they want to use in G to the challenge of keeping unconstitutional laws in place. You know, this is a law that violates rights, we're gonna keep it in place, but people's, people whose rights are being violated can come and get an exemption from that law. So that will uh, limit the impact, the negative rights impact of the suspension. And then remember the suspension will fall eventually, right? At one point it will fall um, and we'll have, the law will be, uh, will be uh, declared invalid. Um, so what we see with that approach in G, it seems to be an embrace of exemptions. This is a very particular context though, uh, pairing the exemption with the suspension. So I don't wanna say the court is now gonna start giving exemptions all the time to laws, um, but certainly we've seen them open the door to it more now, uh, recognizing that it's an, often an appropriate remedy uh, when, it's, um, when it's holding an unconstitutional law in place. All right, so that's just at the tip of the iceberg about remedies. There's, it's a very rich, uh, complex area, but I hope I've provided you with some guidance about uh, what a judge will do when faced with an unconstitutional law or an unconstitutional um, act committed by a state actor. Um, and so you, you have had a sense of the options available to judges and also the principles and the, the factors that go into a judge's decision when determining which remedy is appropriate. So that concludes my lecture. Thank you for listening to my talk and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. That was, uh, I think, a really good breakdown and, and clear outline of kind of the options that are available. So we're gonna turn over to the questions uh, from our attendees. Um, just as a reminder, you can ask questions by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, so let's get started. I see a few questions here. Okay, so this one I think goes a little bit beyond what you talked about, but maybe you have some thoughts on it. Um, they say, I've been seeking answers or direction regarding when mandatory minimums uh, sentences contradict GLADU. So I don't know if you have any comments about the interaction between mandatory minimums and GLADU. Um, so that's that's a quite specialized area and it's outside my area. GLADU is particularly um, uh, specialized. Um, and so I wouldn't want to um, necessarily um, uh, comment not, um, not having um, uh, anything very uh, insightful to, to say about it. Um, there have been cases recently on mandatory minimums um, and uh, there's been quite a few struck down. Um, uh, so the court has sort of, um, NUR is a case that occurs to me, N-U-R. Um, so you can look that case up. I think that's 2015. Uh, but the court is, um, is really closely monitoring the mandatory minimums and engage with them and uh, policing them. Um, and so, uh, um, Gladu will uh, should in theory be part of their uh, their their uh, thinking about when they violate uh, mandatory minimums. Uh, that's just a very general answer. I'm sorry, I can't provide more information on that. Thank you. Um, so this is a little bit of a specific question too. Um, I've been following the Chan slash Sullivan appeals to the SEC, noting that Section 33.1 of the Criminal Code was declared unconstitutional by an Ontario Court of Appeal in 2021. It seems there's one camp that thinks that a superior court's jurisdiction is provincial only, another camp which states that a declaration of unconstitutionality is authoritative as to the others, i.e. declarations of unconstitutionality issued by a superior court with jurisdiction over the parties, subject matter and remedy have binding force against the world at large. Which camp are you in and why? Um, so I think that's a question about um, horizontal um, uh, binding and stare decisis. And, you know, I should be following this more. I know the Supreme Court's going to gonna weigh in on it, uh, but I tend to think not um, that, you know, um, courts that are at the same level don't bind each other. Um, but that's not, a, again, a very informed <laughs> opinion. I look forward to the Supreme Court um, telling us um, more about that. And the Chan and Sullivan is interesting, of course, for its... Um, uh, 33.1, um, the, the removal of the defense of extreme intoxication. Um, that'll be interesting to see what happens um, substantively on that case as well. 
Thank you. So um, here's a question. Um, what are your thoughts about the role of the court to decide in the Jordan case about specific timelines within which cases should be brought before the courts and decided? Was this an overreach given the court's role? Um, yeah, so I, um, uh, so the Jordan case um, was about a uh, right, to, uh, so for people that aren't familiar, um, a right to um, trial within a reasonable time. Um, and prior to Jordan would had sort of, um, so the right to trial within a reasonable time is protected by the charter section 11B, um, I believe. Um, prior to Jordan would had an approach that was very like, um, complex and balancing and discretionary, and it was very unpredictable um, uh, what would happen, um, uh, whether the, the time had been too long or not. And so in Jordan, the court gave these firm uh, deadlines that this, you know, uh, Crown government, you have, uh, I believe it's 18 months to get to tr uh, get a matter through trial um, in the lower courts and 30 months in the superior courts. Um, and that's firm. Um, there's a little bit of wiggle room in the case of, you know, uh, sort of emergencies and COVID has proven to be <laughs> uh, quite, uh, put a lot of pressure on, you know, um, on that wiggle room. Um, but those those deadlines are quite, um, quite firm. Um, I don't necessarily think it's an overreach to set those, um, I don't know if it was the best idea <laughs> uh, because it's been, you know, um, Discretion has a lot of uses to have more balancing approaches. Um, you know, there can be lots of things that come up, but Jordan does try to have, it has that little bit of discretion in it as well, as well as these um, firm deadlines. And Jordan is a response to a uh, response to an area that ne needed some, some firmer guidance. It seemed like nobody knew what was happening there. Um, so that's what they're responding to. I think the, the concern that people have with, um, with Jordan and actually predates Jordan is that the remedy that the court gave for um, 11B violations, um, so trial within a reasonable time remedy, is a stay of proceedings. Um, and so it's one of those um, one of those individualized 24-1 remedies I discussed. And it means that the proceeding is stayed, the Crown can't go through with the trial. And that's pretty extreme. Um, you know, if you don't get it within 18 months, then it's done. Um, and some people have suggested maybe a better approach, a better remedy would have been like a sentencing discount. Um, so, you know, if it takes 22 months, you knock three months off the person's sentence. Um, and that might have been a remedy that was, um, that was uh, a better, caught it, ha had a better balance um, to it. Um, and I think there's, there's merit to that idea as well. Um, yeah. So those are my thoughts on that. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so this one talks about the issue of maids medical assistance and dying. Um, it said in that the, this case, the court was asked by parliament to extend the time for declaration of invalidity. Given the you know, different branches of government, is it appropriate for parliament to be coming cap in hand to the court for such a request? Should parliament I, ever be put in that circumstance? I, I have such an opinion on this. <laughs> I wrote uh, an op-ed um, just before the, the um, second Carter um, decision uh, was heard that the, so the government, uh, so just to give people background that aren't familiar with it, um, uh, Carter was a challenge to the prohibition against assisted suicide, uh, physician assisted death, and the Supreme Court found that it's unconstitutional to prohibit, so that in some narrow circumstances, um, people have the right to have uh, medical assistance and ending their lives. But this was a pretty big change to the law, and so the court suspended the decision for a year. So it gave Parliament a year um, to, um, to get its act together and come up with a law. Parliament didn't. Uh, part of the issue was that it was a federal election, uh, which was predictable because I think it was fixed election date at the time. Um, and so they came right before the suspension was about to expire and said, can we have another six months, please? Um, and the court ultimately um, said yes, but they gave them four months. Um, and the government did get its legislation in place um, in time before the, the declaration of invalidity took effect. Uh, I wrote an op-ed uh, just before the, the request for more time was heard, saying, I don't understand why the government is doing this. If they want to keep this unconstitutional law in place, they can do that. 
they have section 33 of the charter. Section 33 of the charter is what we call the notwithstanding clause or the override. Section 33 lets unconstitutional um, laws stay in place. Um, so it's very controversial. You guys have probably heard of section 33, uh, but it's the government's power to essentially bypass the courts and say, we don't care court, you can't even look at this law, unconstitutional or not, it stays in place. It's only for some uh, rights provisions, um, but section seven, which was at issue in Carter um, is one of those provisions. And so the government could have given itself more time. It could have given itself five more years if it needed five more years, if it used section 33. And I felt like it just wasn't being transparent about the costs. You want a rights, a rights violating law to be in place, then own it. Pass a, a law with section 33, affirming it. Don't go to the court and pretend, oh my, we would really like this unconstitutional law to stay in place, but we can't do anything. You can do something about it. Um, so I thought this was quite clever and insightful. Um, and the Supreme Court in G, um, the majority rejected this <laughs> as having any relevance to the issue of suspending declarations. Um, and so in the case of G, uh, one of the issues that had been brought up is, well, what about Section 33? Why should the court be um, you know, holding these unconstitutional laws in place when the government can do that for itself? And the majority said, that doesn't matter what the government can do. This is about what we can do. And so who cares what the government can do? Uh, we have to think about our remedies uh, being self-contained and not in reference to the government's powers. Um, and so uh, that's uh, my, my, my thoughts on that. I, I hope I've answered your question. Uh, I touched a, touched a nerve about, <laughs> uh, about something that I have been uh, writing on. Yeah, thanks I for the question. I think you did. Um, and where was the op-ed published in case anyone's interested in trying to find uh, yeah, it? Yeah, it was in the National, National Post. I had written a little, um, there was a little article in the Saskatchewan Law Review on um, the court's decision to suspend the declaration in that case too. So if anyone's interested, they, they can read further uh, about your thoughts on that. Um, so I have a question here. Inferior courts and tribunals cannot strike down legislation. Any comments with them only being left with exemptions and on appeal to superior court, that court might strike the provision down. Does this work fine in your view? Yeah, so these are questions around jurisdiction, like who has jurisdiction to um to uh, issue which remedy. And I didn't want to get into the weeds on some of this. Um, uh, but yeah, so um, uh, a lower court or a tribunal um, and uh, tribunals might depend on their uh, enabling statute um, um, can, um, um, can deal with the constitutional matter in front of it, right? So it doesn't have to, even though it can't, um, uh, uh, have a declaration of invalidity under section 52 uh, necessarily, it can, um, it doesn't have to apply an unconstitutional law, right? Um, and so that individual uh, won't be, um, it will get that individual like, exemption or some other, um, some other uh, remedy. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think that that works. Um, again, this isn't something I've necessarily thought about um, the most about some of the um, uh, jurisdictional issues. So other people might have different opinions about it might be a better system um, uh, set up in different ways. Um, but I, I haven't seen any problems necessarily, uh, in, in practice, but I'm, I'm willing to be convinced by people that think that, um, that it's the jurisdictional issues, uh, as they are, aren't currently working. The next couple of questions are, are quite specific. So I don't know if you, <laughs> if, if you'll have, if you'll have something to say about them. Um, but, but I'll go with the first one here. It says, what do you think will the fallout uh, be the fallout story of the recent changes to impaired driving laws in Alberta, where the police now have the right to search without just cause. Also, the two-hour window delay charges of impaired driving, i.e. people getting contacted by police after they are home. Uh, yeah, so I haven't been following um, this um, specifically, uh, but I think it's a question of um, uh, whether it's a violation, right? Um, and so um, I'm sure that there will be a challenge. Um, at one point, if there's not al already, um, I just haven't been following um, the circumstances around around that legislative change. change. So I apologize, I can't I have more insight into that. Yeah. And, th and this one might be similar, it's quite specific. And I would just note for this question for, for the asker, it says anonymous. Um, we, of course, can't give legal advice. This kind of gets, gets quite specific, but of course, um, you know, in these presentations, we can give information, just not, not legal advice. Um, 
So, so again, this might be another one that, that is a little bit outside of what, what you've prepared. Um, it said, what suggestions can you make for dealing with worker compensation board employees who violate Section 7 charter rights as adjudicators? Um, and then they go on to say, then when these charter issues are raised at review and appeal divisions, new adjudicators strike down valid charter arguments and remedies by stating notice was not given to provincial and federal attorney generals. The original issue was not trying to strike down unconstitutional law or policy, but just raising charter issues and remedies. Uh, again, I'm, it's just, uh, I'm not, I'm not um, sure um, uh, in, uh, uh, about the, the specifics to answer that. Um, there is requirements in legislation to, um, to uh, give notice when um, uh, uh, charter issues are coming up, but I'm not, um, it sounds like there's a question about the scope of that, le those legislative provisions, um, whether they apply to, uh, how broadly they apply. Um, and so I would suggest um, either consulting a lawyer or checking out those, um, that legislation, um, uh, blanking on the you know, notice to attorney generals about constitutional questions or something like that is our uh, statutes will be, um, have something like that in their title. So oh, we have one final question here and I'm just gonna paraphrase because it's quite long. And again, I think this might be outside of what you prepared, but I think it basically is asking whether section seven creates obligations. So it asks the section seven, the constitution require police officers and professionals with the Canadian forces or national defense to intercede if politician did not order any professional to keep disabled Canadian alive during the pandemic, including preventing persons from getting infected um, or infected person from entering Canada, um, to prevent at-risk Canadians um, from getting COVID. So basically, I think it's asking about what are the obligations of, of um, you know, police or other enforcement, um, or I suppose you could even say different levels of government um, if, if they're not, um, if people who perhaps um, have disabilities or maybe are more vulnerable um, aren't being protected. So I think it's more of a section seven question whether that creates obligations. Yeah, I think the question is, is a little bit about the scope of Section 7 um, and maybe the proper venue for some concerns about, um, about you know, poor COVID responses, for example. Um, and so, I mean, courts are the place to go to vindicate your, your charter rights, right? And so if you have concerns about Section 7 breaches, um, Section 7 is generally not interpreted in a positive um, manner to, to um, impose obligations. Um, uh, on on um, the government to act, um, but you know some uh, there's some scenarios that might look like that through certain lenses because of um, this uh, social context in which um, the the prohibition or the provision is um, enacted. Um, but yeah, the the court is the the venue um, to to have those rights uh, vindicated and to have the scope of them um, set out. Thank you so much. So we're actually at time um, and we did manage to get through all the questions. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much, um, Professor Burningham, um, for sharing your knowledge and experience with us and taking the time to answer the questions uh, from attendees. Um, and for, I think, what was a really um, insightful and I think well laid out presentation. Um, we're so thankful um, that you were prepared to share your time with us. Um, I'd also like to thank Zara Ahmed, who's our administrator, and Patricia Parody, our executive director, who helped with organizing, advertising, and preparing for this webinar, uh, as always. Um, and thank you, of course, um, to, to our audience for, for coming today and for your interest. Um, I hope that you, you enjoyed it and maybe you learned something new about the charter um, or relearned something you, you'd forgotten about. Um, as I said before, this webinar will be recorded. It's gonna be available on the website and YouTube in the next couple of days. And just as a reminder, when we end, um, there will be a pop-up for feedback form and we'd so appreciate if you would fill that out. So thank you so much, everyone, and uh, be well. Thank you. <laughs>